My name is C.K. Lin. Welcome to Noble Warrior. This is the place where we talk about the pursuit of fulfillment after achieving high level of success in starting purpose-driven organizations. Today's guest is Mike Zappi Zapolin. We cover many topics in the next 90 minutes. Zappi is a serial entrepreneur who is considered a pioneer in the domain names industry. He has created internet brands such as music.com, beer.com, computer.com. Zappi is also a filmmaker. He directed the award-winning documentary film with Deepak Chopra and Michelle Rodriguez, The Reality of Truth. In our conversation, he shared how he transitioned from the pursuit of the American dream to the pursuit of fulfillment and alignment. He talked about vibrating at your own frequency rather than vibrating at the frequency that society expects you to. He shared his experience with different types of catalysts, psilocybin, ayahuasca, iboga, ketamine. He shared the benefits of these tools at the individual level, including gaining more empathy as well as competitive advantages. He also shared the benefits of these tools at the organizational level, including elevating the collective consciousness of the organization and improving work culture to create a disruptive company. He also shared the potential benefits of these tools at the society level. For leaders who have achieved success and are seeking more fulfillment, this is an interview you don't want to miss. Now, a little housekeeping. If you want to get one of the most powerful techniques I've learned to get clarity about your greater purpose in a direct and accelerated way, go to noblewarrior.com forward slash purpose. I also want to take a quick moment to talk to you. If you are enjoying this episode and all the nuggets of wisdom shared here by Zappi, please take a moment and go to bit.ly forward slash noble warrior review and leave us a five star review. It really help other entrepreneurs and leaders like you find us. Thanks in advance. I hope you guys love this conversation with Zappi as much as I did. I'll tell you, CK, um, I'm honored to be here, first of all, because I've, you know, you and I have known each other for a number of years now, you know, not like in a close friendship, but just been, you know, staying on each other's paths and each other's radars. And, you know, for me, um, you know, life got really simple when I realized that I really had, you know, one macro goal. And, you know, when you're young, hunger in business and you're chasing success and all these things that, you know, society tells you that you should go after. Um, at a certain point, I think when you hit the point where you've done those things and maybe you're thinking to yourself, I should be feeling a different way right now. I should feel, you know, more successful, more secure, more happy. And when you're not feeling that way, that's almost when that second mountain happens where you're like, wow, I'm not, I cannot just continue to do what I'm doing because it's not bringing me that satisfaction that I was told that I was going to get by chasing this first mountain. And so, you know, for me, I, you know, had done what I said this in the reality of truth, but I did everything society told me to do, go to work, get a job, have a family, make money. Um, live the American dream. And that is going to bring you all the happiness you need. And you're like, wow, I'm going for it. And you do it. And when you get to a point where you're like, you know what, I feel happiness, but um, there's something about, you know, myself that I need to dig deeper. I need to understand. I need to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Real, you know, for me, as I was having what you would call the American dream and achieving the American dream, you know, working on Wall Street, becoming a vice president, becoming an entrepreneur, making millions of dollars, having a family, all these things, you know, I right there was like, how can I not be 100% happy, you know, happiness in my life? And I realized at that moment that I was going to have to go inside my own mind and discover really who I was, perhaps what I'm here to do, and that I felt like I had searched for all these answers outside of myself. And now it was time for me to go inside. And that's really, you know, my documentary, The Reality of Truth. That's really what was that journey, because I had been hearing about, you know, ayahuasca and San Pedro, some of these incredible catalyst that could 
you know, bring you back to your own frequency. And I realized I'm going to have to go down in the jungle and I'm going to have to have this experience myself because the Western approach of, uh, you know, happiness, fulfillment, uh, um, it's, it's not really, you know, complete picture. Now, obviously in the future, when plant medicine comes here to the United States and people are having these inner experiences that they can add to their outer experience, that's when I think there's going to be an, a next level of fulfillment here in the United States. Um, so quick, so quick interjection real quick, by the yeah. way, so that, you know, I'm going to, uh, interrupt and choose to find more clarity on some of the terms that you use. Yes. So the, don't take it personally if I... If no. I um, you say happiness and fulfillment. Can you define as what that means for you? Yeah. So, you know, what I found out was that, you know, if you can resonate at your true frequency, you know, the frequency when you were a little kid before society and your parents and the institutions around us put an imprint on you of what, how you're supposed to think and feel. Um, you have an original frequency before all that happened. And if you can get back to that, uh, you're going to have uh, a lot of fulfillment because I think, you know, the problem is people are vibrating at a frequency that's outside of their own, you know, true base frequency because they're mirroring and matching other people in society's frequencies. And I was really lucky, CK, early in my life to have uh, a psychedelic experience where I saw that everything was just energy and that everything was made up of atoms. They were all the same, but everything was vibrating at a slightly different frequency. So when I looked at my hand and I saw these billions of atoms spinning in my hand and I looked at it and I said, and then I looked at my friend and I saw that he was made up of the same atoms, but he was just vibrating at a slightly different frequency than me. And the table that was in between us was vibrating at a different frequency, but it was the same uh, atoms. I was like, Oh my God, you know, this is, this is it. This is, you know, it's all about frequency. And how would I had um, I would say I was in my, um, late teens. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. And, yeah. It really stuck with me because it's, you can't unsee that, you know, if I want to close my eyes and see everything at the frequency level, I now can do it thankfully. But, you know, I, I didn't appreciate that maybe quite even as much as I did until when I later, when I was making the reality of truth and I consciously decided to go sit with a shaman with some friends like Michelle Rodriguez, the actress, right. and some relatives and friends of mine. And we sat with that shaman and I thought, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to go in there and ask for answers or what's my purpose. And, you know, sometimes people bring a lot of questions into these um, plant medicine or ca these catalysts that can break you through. And I right. just said, you know what, I just want to expand my own consciousness I want to resonate at my own frequency and I'm not going to take anything too seriously. That was my mantra going in. Mm. And, you know, when I, when I, again, think back about, you know, why people, why there's a suicide epidemic, why there's a depression epidemic an addiction epidemic. Um, it's because people are, vi are not vibrating at their true frequency. And when you're not, you're out of alignment. That's what that whole alignment thing is, is you're, vibrating at society's frequency or maybe your family's frequency or your, you know, your career frequency. And whenever you're out of balance with your own true frequency, you, that frequency that you came into this world with it, nothing feels right. And so I just want to say one thing that I think right now, the problem we're having as a society is we're having an empathy crisis. Mm. There's an empathy crisis happening. You know, if you, you know that there's a famine or, or illness, then you think, oh, I want to help that person. Oh, what can I do? And then boom, the phone rings and you get distracted and you're just, you care, but you're not, the difference between caring and empathy 
is mm. empathy means you're able to actually put yourself into the shoes of that other person and that frequency and feel that frequency. And so when you, uh, when, what, as a society, um, we need a critical mass of people to go inside their own minds and come out with more empathy because we have, we just need a, a much higher level of actual empathy. And the only way I've ever seen people get more empathy is to have a near death experience or mm. they use some kind of a catalyst like a plant medicine to break them through, show them, you know, let them resonate in present moment awareness, let them get right back to that present moment awareness, their own frequency. And once they do, they're, it's, a, it's a game changer. And mm. then when they come back out, they have instantly more empathy. Mm. And the last thing I'll say on that is that if we had a critical mass of people with more empathy, we could solve any problem we have as a society you know, mm. famine, violence, all these different things, water shortages. It's like when you hear those things, you go, oh my God, how are we going to fix that? But reality mm. is if we had enough people resonating with enough empathy, we could sit down and say, oh, okay, how about the people that are going to live a hundred years from now? How about the person on the other side of the world? Let's, let's not just consider them, but let's you know, step into their shoes and figure out how to solve it. And I think we could solve any problem we have as a society really easily if we had enough empathy. So I'm, as a goal in my life, I want to, you know, try to bring as many people as possible to have the experience of breaking out of this current reality that we're in um, that has been set for a long time, but to give people instantly more empathy and we can get to that critical mass we don't have to get everybody you know we just have to get a critical mass of people and for me um you know a lot of that has to do with the young people those are the mm. people that um i think if we can focus on getting them to elevate their empathy uh there's no limit on what what they could do so um a quick reflection on my own journey myself uh, I'm mm -hmm. trained as a materialist, uh, specifically in a, a biomedical engineer, PhD in yep. that area. So if um, I didn't actually have any evidence, I wouldn't believe it, right? And, yep. and part of my personal journey, uh, I started my spiritual journey when I met the Dalai Lama, where I really felt, palpably felt his presence and that really got me curious to know, well, what is this thing that I can't even touch or, but I can feel it. Um, yeah. And as you said earlier, I really have to credit my plant medicine journeys to really help me reclaim my heart, reclaim my yeah. um, Your frequency. Exactly. Because I jokingly say that I was a robot and I found my heart through plant medicine journeys. And uh, my life is so much richer now. And I have so much more mm, ways to experience life. Um, and I'm so much more attuned yes. to what possible problems I can help solve collectively as a whole. And I stopped seeing myself as being yes. separate from the collective whole. And these days, it just makes my life a whole lot richer. So I definitely yeah. resonate with everything I love it. you said so far. Yeah, and like you said, the Dalai Lama, you know, when, you know, sometimes when you're around people, be it the Dalai Lama, or just, you can feel that thing. And you can feel that affecting your frequency. And you just, you know, that's when you, and I think, again, if we were, you know, thousands of years ago and you're out and living in nature and you're one with nature, you know, maybe you can, you know, find that state through meditation or breathing or silence or, you know, chanting or something, prayer. But, you know, we're living in this society right now where there's so much information and media and, you know, bombardment happening that it's very, very hard for people to approach what their true frequency is and so i think these catalysts that we have in nature uh primarily these plant medicines and things 
you know, they're such an amazing tool. They're just like a tool to be able to help you to break out of that bombardment and get back to your original frequency because this is overwhelming. You know, it's not sustainable. And you can see as the technology increases, you know, and people's, you know, they're, they're more and more on their screen and more and more in their self. And so they're, they might care quite a bit, but I think their empathy and their ability to, um, you know, to, to, to resonate at their own frequency, it's very disturbed and it's so easy to get back there. Um, so I want to, you know, my goal is to encourage as many people as possible to use these catalysts that we have um, in order to break through. And, you know, in business, people are starting to realize that this is a real competitive advantage. So, you know, coming back to business now, you know, the people that are micro dosing with psilocybin mushrooms or LSD, the people that are using uh, ketamine to have a, a breakthrough, um, the people who are using, you know, say I get back to nature, all these tools that you have, um, these are business tools because, you know, right now, you know, people are being asked to be very creative and use new techniques and new technology and to invent new technology at such a rapid pace that, you know, I like the old Einstein thing goes, you can't solve any problem with the same consciousness that got you into that. And as an entrepreneur, um, you know, I quite frankly think for society that these psilocybin mushrooms in a microdose are probably going to replace all of the antidepressants at some point in the future. So let me actually do a quick question about what you just said. Do you sure. feel that, so you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, in the beginning is physiology, then security, then love and belonging, then um, self-actualization and self-transcendence, right? I probably missed yep. somewhere in the middle. Um, do you feel that this call for more empathy, this call for more awareness is a, mm, a luxury problem? Hey, you know, you guys are doing great materially. So therefore you have the luxury to ask these type of questions. But for us people who have yet to climb our first mountain, we have, you know, our day-to-day -day things to worry about. What would you say that's to people a, like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I believe that this is so central to your success and your happiness that even if you have no money, you have to figure out how to use some of these catalysts in your life, whether it's a psilocybin microdose, which is, you know, extremely cost effective. Probably you could find that for, you know, $2 a week. You could be microdosing psilocybin. Um, for, you know, hundreds of dollars, you could go have a ketamine experience and get back to your core frequency in 45 minutes. So you don't have to go, you know, to a luxury resort. You don't have to go to Peru. You don't have to have some extreme vision quest. You can have a vision quest right where you are. But I think, you know, like they say, um, you know, Oprah Winfrey, uh, meditates every day and says that that makes her more effective. And so there's a lot of people who would say, Oh, you know what? I'm too busy. I'm, I got a business. I got employees, all this stuff. I can't meditate. I got no time. Not realizing that taking that little bit of time that five minutes or that 20 minutes is actually going to make you more effective and quite frankly, more happy while you're doing it. So. Even so, of course, nobody has less time than Oprah Winfrey. So it's ridiculous for people to say they don't have the time, but that's what they manufacture. So to say, Hey, I can't go to Peru. I can't have this experience. Well, you know what? For, you know, probably, you know, under $10, you could have your own vision quest. There's a lot of places now that are even, you know, becoming legal, Colorado, uh -huh. um, in California, multiple Santa Cruz and Berkeley and, um, you know, Oakland, these places are opening up to where, you know, they, they decriminalize these elements. And so for very little dollars, I mean, you know, $10 or something like that, 
you could have an experience with psilocybin mushrooms that would be so deep it would change the rest of your life and give you that empathy and you know like i said these psilocybin microdose in addition to eliminating all the, the antidepressants out there because every time i do a psilocybin microdose i always am like oh my god this is pr- i have so much energy and i'm so you know just have a positive spirit that this uplifted experience and you can get there through in your own neighborhood in your own area or go to an area where it's legal for you to go have this experience so you don't have to go to peru anymore you don't have to you know fly to some luxury resort of course if you can be in the best set and setting possible then that's going to be a great thing you want to do that um but you know we're in a really beautiful moment where the internet has democratized this information and you know, it's not for the rich and it's not for the people who have the time because everybody needs to take a little bit of this time to get back to their own frequency. And to, if you want to break through and have new ideas and new thoughts and be competitively above your competition or people that you're, you know, um, you're competing against even in your own company for the best idea, if you can be bringing these ideas from a different perspective uh that's really empowering Mm. so there's like a famous saying where they say if you don't have an hour to meditate every day meditate for two hours right yes and so so if you don't have time to go to you know um to to have use one of these catalysts to break through then you really need to do it because you're not realizing that this life is supposed to be you know lived at your own frequency You can experience joy and you can experience, you know, your own success. And I think that that success, what that means to you when you start climbing that second mountain, that's when you really, you know, can get a lot of fulfillment from what you're doing and what you're experiencing because you're doing it based on, you know, trying to dig deeper within yourself. So you famously... Well, okay, let me actually backtrack. So we met, we first met at the global uh, conference, uh, Milken Institute Global Conference, I think back in 2006. And yep. what made an impression about uh, you was that you were, you famously shared the story of beer.com, credit card.com, um, and how you turned $80,000 into $7 million, right? So yep. you were through and through an entrepreneur back then. And then since that time, we kept in touch briefly. And then you started share with, sharing with me your studies with Kabbalah. Then, you know, and then you, um, started this documentary, The Reality of Truth. So tell us a little bit about your journey from being a through and through entrepreneur to these days, really being one of the pioneers, being one of the evangelists of plant medicine, these type of catalysts. Can you share with us a little bit of your journey? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, you know, it really comes down to the direct experience because, you know, you can talk about something and you can philosophize, but until you have the direct experience, that can be a really hollow thing to talk about, you know, and, mm. and you think about, you know, what, what if, you know, what if you were to talk about, you know, what, what chocolate tastes like and try to describe that. I mean, you could be really eloquent, but at the end of the day, the person's going to have to try that chocolate Mm. and, and, you know, having an orgasm. It's like, these are things that are just like, they have to be experienced or it's just a, a lot of talk. And so, um, the same thing is the case, I believe with these major catalysts, these plant medicines and things that can break you through. And for, you know, quite some time I was talking about wanting to go down to the jungle to experience going inside with a lot of intent rather than, you know, sometimes when you're younger and you have, you know, uh, you have a psychedelic experience or something, you know, you're just doing it to try it. It's something that, you know, to try, maybe it's even fun or exciting, but you're not doing it with the intent of 
expanding your consciousness. Right. And the I difference between things. recreational and ceremonial. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And I got to the point where I was like, I need to be very intentional about going inside and trying to find, you know, what really resonates with me. And so for a long time, I, I kept getting invited to plant medicine ceremonies with ayahuasca in California. And I kept putting it off and I was just, I was afraid, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and at the end, what were you afraid I, of? What, by the um, way, what were you afraid of? I knew it was going to be a transformational experience. I knew I was going to have to look at aspects of myself that maybe I didn't really want to look at because mm-hmm. they're not super pleasant and mm-hmm. that I might be shown some things about myself that I needed to change. And so I just, you know, it, it's something that's unknown. I just, you know, as I studied, as I researched, I got more and more comfortable with you know, the, the plants themselves. But then I said, okay, I got to put myself in the best set and setting. I got to, if I'm going to do this, I got to do this with somebody who really knows what they're doing and not to throw any shade on the people who were doing that in Topanga. I just knew that, you know, for me, if I could do it in a set and setting where I was in the environment of the plant in the jungle with somebody who is a generational shaman who'd been trained you know, mm-hmm. five, ten, a hundred generations of being a shaman that I was going to have the best experience possible. Mm-hmm. So when I set that up for myself and said, why don't I film this and, and make it into a documentary, which became the reality of truth. So pause, um, for, pa- pause for one second. Yep. If there's a huge jump between, hey, I want to do this ceremony for the first time to talking to a few of my friends and actually you know, produce a documentary, right? That's a huge leap there. Can you tell us a little yes. bit about that? Because not everyone, oh, you know, yeah, make a documentary on their first experience. Leap. Yeah. No, you're right. Um, you know, I think it comes down to, you know, where I was at in my own life, in my own head. You know, I had, I had in my mind really, you know, achieved what I was supposed to do that was told to me would bring me complete fulfillment. And, mm-hmm. You know, when you're faced with that or, you know, all of us have been in a job we don't we don't like or, you know, a relationship that's not satisfying or, um, you know, some thing where you just reach a breaking point. You know what I mean? And you're just like, well, I don't care how much money I'm making. I don't care how, you know, what this is going to do to my career. I have to take a different step. Mm. Uh, Maybe that's somebody becoming an entrepreneur or going from, you know, the corporate world to an entrepreneur, but you reach this breaking point. And, you know, uh, I think when you follow the American dream and you get to the end of that and and it's not full fulfillment, you know, where you rise to some level of, you know, being a champion athlete or some media star, uh, you get to that point and everybody's like, wow, you must be so happy. You're not. Mm. And it's a crisis type moment. And if you're, you know, at one point I was like a vice president at Bear Stearns, you know, mm. on Wall Street and, you know, in the top 10 percent of the firm, you know, uh, as a producer. And I had to leave that behind because I was just like my entrepreneurial spirit. You know, I thought to myself, I got to, you know, go out on my own. I got to do it for myself. I got to be an entrepreneur. I'm, you know, talking about all these companies. And I'm, you know, presenting these as investment opportunities. I, I want to be the company that's, you know, getting invested in. I don't want to be talking about somebody else's thing. So mm-hmm. you reach this moment of crisis where I had to walk out the front door of the firm, even though I was making, you know, more money than most people make. I had to take that that crisis leap and uh, and leave and become an entrepreneur. And I was very glad I did. And mm-hmm. so same thing here. You know, when I said, hey, you know, I've always done production. Um, I've always had elements of creating production in my in my efforts, whether that's commercials or, you know, mm-hmm. social media videos and different things like that. So I've always been doing that. So when I got the opportunity and I said, you know what, this plant medicine journey that I'm going to do for myself, uh, it's it's something I think I'm going to have to capture mm-hmm. on video. Like I've done with other commercials and I've, you know, I've had a Super Bowl ad in the 2000 Super Bowl. And so I've always been known that, you know, if you can 
do something and share it with other people mm. that it's going to have an exponential effect. So I thought, you know, maybe this is my way to pay it forward, make sure that I have a good experience when I do it is to capture it and be willing to share the good and the bad with everybody. Um, I think that'll make my own experience of going inside, you know, that much richer. And uh, so that's why I decided, yeah, I'm going to make a documentary film out of this. It was, you know, 2000. 12 when we started and Mm. you know documentaries they're not you know what they are today but it it seemed like the best vehicle to get this information out and you could i could combine um you know the the science with the actual you know romance of going on a journey all the way down to the jungle Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and including people like Michelle Rodriguez, the actress, because Mm -hmm. I felt like, well, you know, if the audience sees, you know, Michelle Rodriguez going inside her mind using these catalysts, you know, they can think to themselves, well, you know, she has quite a bit to lose if this doesn't go right and Mm -hmm. she's willing to do it. So Mm -hmm. if I'm a business owner or, you know, a, a father or a, you know, a member of my community, um, you know, yeah, I have something to lose, but it's probably not as big a, a, a risk as, say, Michelle Rodriguez mm. doing this and allowing it to be filmed. So maybe it could help people to, you know, have a breakthrough for themselves. That's a really interesting point you just made, by the way. So was it an easy uh, enrollment conversation with Michelle or did, did it require some nudging and pushing and persuading and coaxing to for her to yeah. say yes? I mean, the universe is very kind, and I approached her uh, through a friend of mine. And um, oh, so you didn't know her was, personally? So it was a, like a friend I, no, of a friend. I didn't know her personally. I met uh, my my uh, the person who co-directed on the reality of truth, mm. uh, Laurent Levy. He had, mm. he's he'd been a photographer a long time, and he'd been photographing Michelle for different things, and he was friends with her. And when we decided to go, he said you know, let's go over to Michelle's house and let's go invite her, you know, to, to come as one of the people. And of course the universe being, you know, as uh, complicit as it is and, you know, getting whatever the best agenda possible put through, uh, she was in a perfect place where she was like, you know, she was feeling like she needed to have this breakthrough in her own life. And mm-hmm. she had heard about, plant medicine and she decided that hey you know zappy you've set up a really good set and setting for us to go explore this and i want to do it like Mm. i literally i think i I walked out of her place with her passport like she gave me her passport (laughs) you know what i mean that's a lot of trust in one sitting yeah amazing exactly and so um you know and my most recent movie that i'm finishing now uh we're talking to distributors about where to put it out uh, features Lamar Odom, the basketball player, Kardashian. Mm. Mm. And, you know, everybody knows he had a really public breakdown. He was in a coma from a drug overdose in a brothel. He um, had what people maybe don't know is he had 12 strokes, six heart attacks, wow. kidney failure, liver wow. damage, um, all these really serious medical issues. And what's really interesting about Michelle and, and Lamar is they're both really amazing communicators, both really funny, both really eloquent, but uh, they're also kind of, they beat to their own drum, you know, because they don't just, you know, if their agent says, or their manager says, ah, oh, don't do that movie. You know, it's about psychedelics. Don't sign the release, you know, don't let them film you in case this and that. Mm. And they're just both like, well, what I need to do this in my own life. So I'm doing it. Mm. And so, both of those guys, they resonate at their own frequency and they were both willing to, you know, pay it forward and share their experience. But they mm. both also knew that they needed to have this experience for themselves. It was, it was, they had to have it, you know, and Michelle at that time, she had to have the ayahuasca mm. and Lamar, you know, he, he'd never gone inside of himself at all. He'd been told not to do that in, in society. Um, as an African American man, not to go inside his mind because, you know, if, if it went bad, you know, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a problem with, even within psychedelics where there's, um, 
you know, we need to create environments that are nurturing and set and setting for everybody because, you know, if you're a white person and you have a bad experience on psychedelic, you know, when you're a teenager, you're going to go talk to a therapist and your whole community is going to be behind you and be like, it's okay, you know, but if you're an African-American kid and you have a bad experience and you, you know, slip out, uh, you know, you could be shot, you could be put in a mental institution the rest of your life. And mm, so this mm. is like dangerous and unfair to, you know, minority communities. Serious and consequences. So, yeah. You know, Lamar, uh, you know, recognized that he really had no other choice. He tried everything else. And he said, I'm willing, happy to, you know, let you guide me and go inside my mind. And I wound up giving him some ketamine treatments, mm. low dose ketamine, which has been shown to break depression, addiction, um, suicidal ideation. And when he got comfortable and stable with that, uh, I brought him down to Mexico to do an ibogaine uh, journey, which is an African route that mm. is known to be able to break a heroin addiction or a meth addiction in, you know, one session, you know, 12 hours, it can break those difficult, difficult experiences. And so he had such an incredible experience that, you know, 48 hours later on the car ride back to Los Angeles from Mexico, uh, he told all of us in the, in the van that he felt so good that he thought he could play professional basketball again. Mm. And, his uh his bodyguard trainer was with us and the guy was oh take it easy Lamar you know dude you have to work out four hours a day you can't be smoking marijuana and Lamar was like I know what I got to do I've done it before I'm doing it Mm. and we were all like wow you know and four months later he played in his first professional basketball game in a tournament in Dubai and it was just like such an amazing rocky comeback story Mm. You know, to see this guy who, you know, possibly wasn't going to walk again mm. or even die, but he, after he came back out of the coma and stuff, maybe never be the same. And here he is playing basketball again with no fear because he said, you know, that's what happened to him in his experiences with the ketamine and the ibogaine is he lost his fear. So mm. he knew he wasn't the same player that he was now he's 40 when he is, he was when he was, you know, in his 20s. Mm. But he, he almost died. Like, who cares? Like, he's just, it's having fun. He's, mm. you know, fulfilling part of himself that he wants to explore. And he's doing it without fear because of these catalysts that broke him through. Mm. How, so how, I'm really excited to share that with How did it make you feel to, to be the curator of such a transformational experience? You know, it, it's just, it's a really satisfying, you know, it's hard work, you know, and that's why, you know, um, you know, not everybody does it or not even, not everybody, you know, wants to even guide people because it is, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work. It's a deep dive and it's not always, you know, the most comfortable situation, but, you know, I've been, uh, self, um, putting a title on myself because I've been trying to think about what it is that I'm doing these days. And I came up with a term, mm. of course I bought the domain name, but I, I uh, came up with a term, uh, psychedelic concierge. Mm. Mm. And I feel like that's what I'm doing. Meaning I'm not the shaman. I don't have total expertise in these plants. I have no business giving these to anybody. I don't want to give them, mm. but, um, like a concierge, when you go, let's say you're at the hotel and you're in a town you don't know and you say, oh, I want to, we want to go to dinner. Where should we go? And so that concierge is going to ask you some questions. He's going to say, well, what kind of food do you like? Okay. Do you, you want to have uh, a lot of people watching? Do you want it to be romantic? Do you want to, you know, are you interested in wine? Uh, do you want to see a show with it? You know, what's your, what's good for you? And then you answer those questions. They go, ah, okay. I, you're going to go here. And mm. so, you know, I have enough experience now, you know, having sat with hundreds of people and, you know, having these different experiences for myself that when somebody comes to me now, you know, as a psychedelic concierge, I could say, aha, okay, this person needs to get stabilized. And then maybe they're disconnected from nature. So they should do San Pedro. Mm -hmm. Maybe they need a hug from their mother or their grandmother. So they should do ayahuasca. Maybe this person has an addiction profile or something like that. Maybe they need to do ibogaine mm. um, or, you know, maybe they should be just microdosing psilocybin, but to, to 
you know, basically understand where they're at quickly and then make the right determination about what balance of things they should do feels really good to me because I get so much satisfaction after the person does it because, you know, with, with plant medicine and with these catalysts, the great part is that the transformation is immediate. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you know, it's like different than if you're following somebody who's on a diet program or a health routine or something and well, therapy, it's going to take yeah. several months or years to get to where they want. Mm. This could be one, you know, one hour, one day mm. that they transform themselves. They get back to their own frequency. I love it. That's awesome. It's so really rewarding. So would you say this is your second mountain? Yes, I would say this is my second mountain. And one of the one of the best advice I got when I was going into my second mountain, I got from Joel Osteen, the preacher. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the advice I thought. I thought he was going to be closed minded about psychedelics and all these different things that I was talking about. And he really wasn't. It was really amazing to me. Um, he was, you know, very, you know, resonating his own frequency. So he wasn't afraid to talk about these things or to contemplate whether you know, something I was saying could actually be right or, you know, uh, or new information. But what he said to me after, you know, we, we hung out, he said, you know, he said, Zappy, I thought about it. He goes, you know, you're going to have to approach getting psychedelics out to society the way that I approach, you know, getting people to come to what I do within Christianity. Mm -hmm. And he said, because what, what it is, is I'm, you know, Christian and I have a lot of Christians that don't like me. They tell mm. they don't think I'm telling people they're going to go to hell enough. Mm. And, you know, here we are, we're all Christians and they don't like me. They mm. actually don't like me. And he's like, so what you have to do is you have to recognize that there are 25% of the people that love you no matter what you do. Mm. They're on your team. They mm. love you. Don't worry about them. Mm. He's like, you have 25% of the people that hate you no matter what you do. If mm. you cure cancer, they're going to say you're putting cancer doctors out of business. Yeah. They just don't <laughs> like you. You know, he's like, so forget about that. Mm. He's like, but you got this 50% in the middle mm. that you could bring over to your side mm. and you have your critical mass right there. So mm. He's like, so just forget about all the people that love it and the people that hate it. Don't worry. Just go for the middle. And for me, the middle is the youth audience, you know, the, the young people who can, you know, they're, they've been taken out of their original frequency, but they're not so far gone that they're in the 25% that are just completely jaded. Those 25%, mm. they'll come along, you know, in the end by osmosis and change of everybody else, but just focus myself. And I, it was such good advice because I used to get frustrated. I'd say, oh, I want everybody to do plant medicine. And people would be like, oh, yeah, good luck getting so-and-so to do it. And I was like, you know what? I don't need so and so to do it. Mm -hmm. I just need, you know, the people in the middle mm -hmm. come over and and check this out, have the direct experience, increase their empathy, and mm -hmm. that's how we get to this critical mass. And I don't have to think one more thought about those people that mm -hmm. aren't, you know, on the squad or never going to be on the squad mm -hmm. uh, or not on the first wave. So mm -hmm. as soon as I got that information, it freed me up going into my second mountain. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be a, a, an advocate for going inside your mind mm. for trusting nature mm. and for not taking it too seriously. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be my three pillars of getting up that second mount. And, um, you know, that it feels really good. And, um, uh, at the same time, um, you know, that second mountain for me now, I've, I've got, I've tried to get even more granular in what my approach should be. Mm. So, you know, for a while I was just, you know, I came back from Peru and I was ranting to everybody, ah, oh, you got to go sit with a shaman. And mm. people were like, oh, you know, you're not zappy. Like my family's not going to let me, you know, go down to the jungle and sit with a shaman. They'll Baker act me. They'll put me in a mental institution if I tell them I'm doing that. Mm. So I was, I was really frustrated. I was like, ah, oh, I got to find a Western medicine approach to this. Mm. And all of a sudden, I was shown ketamine. Mm. And ketamine is a FDA-approved medication. Yep. It's the number one anesthetic used by oral surgeons on children. Yes. It's very fast-acting, and it's extremely safe. It doesn't affect your respiratory system. Uh, but they found out 
that if you give somebody a low dose of ketamine over a 45 minute period, it can actually break depression, uh, suicidal thoughts, anxiety, and even affect addiction, which, you know, at the end of the day, addiction is all about, you know, some trauma that people are trying to cover over. They're not really just like addicted to the drug itself. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, I got to try this ketamine. I wound up trying it. And I realized that this is the gateway for Western culture to Mm. have a conscious experience in a Western medicine doctor's office. Mm. They go in there and the ketamine, they give it to you in either an IV Mm. over 45 minutes or they give you an intramuscular shot of ketamine Mm. uh, over, you know, 45 minutes that this experience lasts. But what's beautiful is after that experience is over, 15 minutes later, you're totally fine. You can go walk out and go, you know, get a smoothie and, you know, an hour later, whatnot, go back to work, go hang with your kids, go exercise, whatever you want to do. It's got the complete experience within this very tight clinical one hour. And um, when I realized that, I was like, wow, this is could be the gateway to to plant medicine, to Western society going as deep as they need to to get back in touch with their frequency Mm. and i say that because when you experience the ketamine which a lot of people think even plant medicine people think oh that's synthetic blah 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 it's not synthetic okay it's a crystal and you put some salts and some minerals together and a new crystal forms which is amazing because as we know crystals have a very clean slate you can put you know positive energy on them but What's interesting is, you know, putting some salts and minerals together and forming this new ketamine crystal is no different than an ayahuasca shaman taking the vine of the ayahuasca vine and mm-hmm. putting it together with the chacruna leaf right. and boiling those two and making ayahuasca. It's just a modern, a pr- you know, a modern moving around of, of energies and frequencies. And so when you do the ketamine and you have that experience, it's very peaceful. But what happens is you get put into what I would call present moment awareness, Mm. where there's actually no future. There's no past. You're just in that present moment. And when and most people never get there, they even if they meditate in a cave for 30 years, never mind, you know, walking around in 2020, you know, uh, Western culture, they just never get into that present moment awareness with no fear of the future, no regret of the past and when you're in that present moment for you know 45 minutes you can live a thousand lifetimes Mm. and you get to look at your life and some of these things that happen from a third party perspective Mm. and when you come out you immediately have more empathy for yourself and for everybody else Mm. and the fact that we can do this in a Western doctor's office with an FDA approved medication is such a godsend because this is what's going to bring a critical mass of people to go inside, have this experience and come out with more empathy. Do you, do you so feel- I'm really excited about it. I mean, I've sat with hundreds of people now who've done ketamine. Some of them were suicidal. They had like bandages on their arms where they tried to kill themselves. Mm. Some of them had come back from, you know, extreme PTSD in, in battlefield situations. Some had had, you know, horrible car accidents or il- illnesses or death in their family, things that are, you know, just disrupt your, your ability to function. And in one session, by getting into present moment awareness, by being in that God conscious moment for yourself, mm. uh, is incredible. But also the ketamine has this almost like advanced technology where when you're in there, usually when somebody's suicidal, they either think, okay, I keep doing what I'm doing or I kill myself. Those are the only two options I have. But when you're in the ketamine, all of a sudden you see, you know, a dozen options and the person's looking at it and they're going, wow, you know what? I could do that, which might lead to that, or I Mm. like doing this and maybe I could do this and this and that would, you know, and you just, All their option sets are open. And so when they come out, they're not suicidal. They're like, you know, they're on to do their second mountain. Mm. And 
it's so fast and so effective and so clinical that I really believe, you know, nature's very intelligent and it's coming out with these plants and it's coming out with catalysts like crystals. And we're, you know, we're at a point now as a society where we understand science and biology and language and all these things that we can finally tap into some of these things and measure their effectiveness and, you know, combine elements to figure out what the best uh, catalysts are. But it turns out that, you know, the ketamine is really, it's the ultimate triage right now. Mm. And it's the ultimate way for a Western person who's really comfortable with, you know, going into a doctor's office, taking an FDA approved medication that's been shown to be very safe Mm. and go in there for depression or addiction or, you know, that kind of thing, but come out with uh, enlightenment and increased empathy. Mm. And when that happens, it totally changes your whole life. And, um, you know, most people don't have to do, you know, as many treatments, you know, as a person who has treatment resistant depression, which Yale University uh, said is to do six treatments of ketamine over a couple weeks, and then to do one booster treatment every month or few months based on you know, where your depression is. But what ha- what's happening in the ketamine is they've shown scientifically that when it uh, metabolizes, it builds new neural pathways in the brain around trauma and depression. Mm. So you're actually building uh, new brain matter, new neurons, fixing broken ones. And a lot of us have neuron patterns in our brain that we may have inherited or maybe they came from a traumatic experience, but they're, they're loops in the psyche that people have where they say, oh, I'm a failure, it'll never work out, I'm a loser, I can't, it won't work, nobody's going to love me. They have these patterns. They filter everything through those patterns. And the ketamine breaks that pattern, mm. builds new neural pathways around those patterns that aren't real anyways and not productive, and now you're building up these patterns these uh, pathways that are, you know, your own frequency because the ketamine absolutely, everyone who does it describes that frequency that when that hits you, it's very calming, it's very peaceful, but you come out really resonating at your own frequency. And Mm. that's to do that in, you know, 45 minutes. That's, you know, that's why Cleveland Clinic called ketamine a top 10 medical breakthrough. Mm. And it was the only mental health one which means it's basically the biggest breakthrough in mental health that's happened in the last, you know, hundreds of years. Mm, it's beautiful. So let me recap. You, you said a lot in the last 10 minutes. So let me recap real quick. The number one thing that I took away. So you started your journey back in 2012, and then now you stumble upon ketamine as a gateway to solve um, PTSD, depression, anxiety, overwhelm, especially for those who are not um, adapted or uh, well attuned to the world of psychedelics. And it's a fast treatment, 45 minutes, FDA approved, very safe, you know, Western, a custom type of setting. So therefore, you're really focusing on those areas and using ketamine as a way to really solve um, this problem in the area yeah. of mental health specifically. Is that an accurate yeah. way to recap? That's perfectly accurate. And I would say what, what, what I decided to do uh, along with a business partner named Warren Gumpel, Warren Gumpel and I uh, started something called the Ketamine Fund. And mm. Warren's been involved with me with the Lamar movie and helping Lamar to have those ketamine treatments. Mm. And Warren's a ketamine advocate. It saved his life. You know, he had depression and he was on all kinds of medications for years and years and nothing was working. And he finally, you know, found the ketamine. And after just a couple of sessions, it is he felt in, you know, his entire life. Mm. And he realized that he needed to advocate for this. And so we came together and we started something called the Ketamine Fund, mm. which is a nonprofit uh, dedicated to bringing down suicide rates by 75% using Mm. ketamine. Mm. And those numbers come from doctors in the 
ketamine space who say that, you know, this is over 75% effective against ket- against suicidal ideation. And so Warren and I decided to do, uh, you know, to try to focus it rather than putting it out on all of society to begin with. We thought, let's focus on veterans. They mm. really need it. They deserve it. Mm. And, you know, they're in extreme situations of suicidal and homicidal ideation. And so uh, we put together a our ketamine fund, not 501c3. You can check out ketaminefund.org. We put together 400 free treatments for better to, with like a mini clinical trial. And we fill out a standard mood monitoring uh, assessment each time they do the ketamine mm. and it's called a PHQ nine. And we, so we've been putting these veterans through and some of them were on, you know, 20 plus medications from the VA. Some were suicidal, some were, you know, abusing recreational drugs just to numb the pain. Mm. And they start getting the ketamine treatments. They get put into present moment awareness. They vibrate at their own frequency and they build new neural pathways in the brain. And, you know, you can see some videos on ketaminefund.org where there's veterans, you know, talking about just being, you know, in the first time they did it, being in a whole new state of mind. Mm. And I just want to say that um, the ketamine, the new science out on the ketamine says that you it works on the default mode network of your yep. brain, mm. which is like an ancient area of your brain. And what it does is there's an, there's a mechanism in there called your lateral habenula Mm -hmm. and your lateral habenula records all the stress that's ever happened to you in your entire life. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to a overwhelmed, it gets to a tipping point, it goes into burst mode, which is Mm -hmm. another total brain state. And it shuts off your dopamine production, Mm -hmm. which is the source of your happiness and your motivation to do anything. Mm -hmm. And so it shut down and, the ketamine, the first time you do it, it takes your brain out of burst mode. So you immediately start getting your dopamine back. And mm. the doctor in Utah who's running our clinical trial with the veterans, Dr. Heemstra, he says he, he used to think that, you know, that depression was like a really complex thing. And he's like, it's actually really simple. You're mm. not getting your dopamine. And the ketamine turns back on your dopamine. So you're walking around smelling the flowers instead of, you know, looking for the tiger to come out from around the corner. Mm. It's like a better way of life. Mm. And so we, we want to get this. Our goal of the ketamine fund is to get, you know, to prove this within the veteran community, to bring this out to the rest of society. And we can bring down suicide rates by 75 percent. We have you know, 120 people a day in the United States committing suicide. The number is actually a lot higher because right. a lot of the overdoses that happen are intentional. Right. Um, so the number is higher. But, that you know, let's say 120, that's 50,000 people a year. If we could use ketamine, very cost effective, it's incredibly cost effective, and disrupt that by 75%, not only do you save all, all those people, but you save their family and their coworkers and their community from having to go through that drama. And, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, totally changing society just by doing that. And then you also make these people, you know, a productive member of society. You know, we talked about, you mentioned how we met at the Milken global conference. Mm. Well, Mike Milken's main philosophy is that, We need to invest in human capital. That's where you get the most return on your investment is in human capital. So if you can take somebody from suicidal, homicidal, affecting their family, their workplace, and their community to a thriving member of that community, uh, you've just tipped the whole balance of human capital. And you've got a whole, you know, incredible mind army that can, you know, bring out this, uh, this empathy and, and get down to solving these problems that we have. So it's, we're at a great time. You know, you couldn't, this couldn't have happened years and years ago when, you know, if the internet wasn't democratizing media and we didn't have basic medical science and data and, you know, the things that we have today, now we can, you know, they can look at your brain under a ketamine treatment using an MRI and they can actually see the area of the brain where depression and addiction take place 
They can see the periaqueductal gray. They can see new dendrites forming on there. So this is beyond, you know, uh, anecdotal. This is science, and thankfully, you know, uh, Western medicine, um, you know, discovered ketamine a long time ago. And what, what was happening was they were using it in the battlefield. And when people were getting amputations, because they wouldn't have to have a, an anesthesiologist there, they would just give them the ketamine and the person would just not feel the pain. And then they could do the operation safely. And the next day, these guys who had just had their arms or legs cut off or some horrible thing were in the infirmary and they were joking around. Mm-hmm. And the people were like, wait a minute, this guy hasn't joked around in two years and he just got his arms cut off. Now he's joking. Like, mm-hmm. what's up? And they realized that it had something to do with the ketamine. And Yale University did a huge study. Um, and they realized that in a low dose, not a high dose where you, you know, put somebody to sleep, um, but in a low dose, you could actually build neural pathways and, you know, break depression. And so, um, it's just a miracle thing. I just want to throw one other thing out because I know probably some people have heard about ketamine and they've heard that, you know, people use this recreationally. They call mm. it special K. Right. And it's used, you know, in nightclubs and things like that. But what those people are doing is they're actually snorting ketamine. So it's going through their nasal passage. It's hitting their opiate receptors. Uh, and they're, you know, they're getting it in a totally different delivery. And they're not able to do the work while they're in there. And they're not able to get that metabolization, proper metabolization that you get in a low dose over time. And so those people that are recreationally using it, um, you know, are not getting the same benefit as somebody going into a doctor's office, getting a low dose in the right way and metabolizing it properly. So um, it's kind of been vilified in the past by, you know, probably by moneyed interests like the pharmaceutical companies that want to sell people their antidepressants and the Xanax and the Zoloft and the Paxil and the Ambien and all that stuff. When the reality is if somebody did uh, low dose ketamine, got back to their original frequency, increased their empathy and built neural pathways in their brain around whatever trauma they have, that's a much better holistic solution than, you know, putting you on some, um, pill that's going to, you know, dampen your spirit and ultimately give you side effects that are going to require other medications. And eventually, you know, you're going to be in, you know, uh, not dead, you know, just in a miserable place. So Zappi, so so you, so you started this journey back in 2012 when, when your own search for fulfillment and meaning with ayahuasca. And now you are, uh, an advocate for academy, and you have set up this academy fund, right? <clears throat> yes. So you're 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 quite open and in public about your advocacy for these life changing catalysts. How has life shifted from for you personally since 2012 till today? Uh, that's a good question. I you know I feel like um, since I got back to my frequency, and I will want more that it wasn't important for me is that I I gain treatment on myself because I just I wanted to experience it I mm. couldn't understand for myself you know having already been sort of a, a psychonaut and trying a lot of different things I was like how could something break a heroin addiction in 12 hours that doesn't even make sense mm. uh, I gotta try this and mm. so I wound up trying the ibogaine it's a it's a very powerful experience it's Mm. an ancestor you know comes from an ancestor based religion in africa where you know they use it to communicate with ancestors and um and to you know get back to basically their original frequency and they have been giving it now for heroin addictions and meth addictions and uh i wanted to try it i tried it out uh it was it was one of the most intense experiences of my life. Mm. But at the same time, I was able to look at things within myself that maybe I needed to change that, uh, or things that didn't resonate with my frequency. And I had to accept that. And it was a great experience. It was a 
physical reboot that it does on you in addition to the, you know, mental reboot that it does. And so that was really a great experience. And then when I found the ketamine, you know, I feel like I'm as creative, if not more creative than I've ever been in my life. Um, you know, the solutions that are coming to me, the things that are happening, you know, uh, seem to be enhanced by the direct experiences I've had with some of these catalysts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when somebody tries to, you know, like they always do when you're an entrepreneur and you're on the cutting edge, you know, there's a lot of pushback. And if you're not resolute in your belief and your own frequency, you're going to be pushed off the mark. Mm. And so I'll just give you an example. You know, when I first started getting into the domain space, I was like, wow, this is incredible. You could, the internet, you're going to be able to track your results and people can use these domain names and they're going to have more credibility in the future. And so I was telling everybody, hey, you got to get domain, get a domain name. And I would talk to somebody, you know, a, a real estate agent, let's say, in, you know, uh, whatever, Greenwich, Connecticut. And I'd say, hey, you should get, you know, real estate, Greenwich, Greenwich.com. You should get Greenwich.com. You should get, you know, real estate, Connecticut. And they, they were like, nah, you know what? I don't need it. You know, I, I already got, I don't, I got a web, but right. And my business is referral. I don't need it. I don't think this internet's going to be whatever it's supposed to be. Right. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, how do they not see it? But I just kept, you know, going forward. And then people started to, you know, people who were supposedly technology experts said, oh, yeah, domain names, those are going to go away. People are just going to search and, you know, there's not going to be domains anymore. It's all going to be apps and right. all these things that they tell you that could disrupt you, either disrupt, you know, your enjoyment or disrupt, you know, the path that you're on. You can get distracted and disrupted by people when you're on the cutting edge. And so, but knowing who you are and having conviction in, in what your, you know, what your belief is, the stronger that is as an entrepreneur, the more effective you're going to be. So mm. even though, you know, you know, I could hear the top guy at Google might have said, or, you know, some company, yeah, domain names, that's over. It's all apps or it's all direct search or it's all, you know, navigation, this and that. I, it didn't mean anything to me. You know, what I mean, I was just like, all right, well, that's your opinion. But, you know, I keep seeing that, you know, more and more people are coming on the Internet. And, you know, direct search still continues to be, you know, domain names have a credibility beyond just search and find. So in my own experience, I wasn't taken off the, that. And I think as an entrepreneur, if you're not vibrating at your own frequency, there's a lot of experts who can tell you why what you're doing is wrong. And mm. if you fall for that, mm. it's going to, you know, you might, you know, give away your, your big home run winner because you got disrupted by somebody else's, you know, limited reality. You know, one of the things that I learned from my PhD days is that in the beginning, before my PhD days, I thought, all right, whatever the scientist or the expert says must be true. Then and from my own study, I realized that you can always find research results supporting your the opinion that you wanted to, to have. So you always kind of find support everywhere. So yeah. regarding the, the naysayers of your, you know, of, of your venture is you always find it that way. So on, on, on that note, um, being a public um, psychedelic advocate what kind of pushbacks are you experiencing because you're very um, public and, yeah. and you're you're also a public figure as well right so what, are you yeah. getting any kind of pushback from other people you know i think i think we're in this empathy crisis moment you know and if you look around in society i have you know celebrities come to me for to help guide them i have top business leaders you know people who you know, if I said their name, you would your jaw would drop. It, your, your jaw would drop. That oh mm. my god, they needed this experience. Mm. Um, you know, family offices, people coming to me, just you know, wealthy, wealthy industrial families. These are now the generation that are taking over, and they're like, you know what? I don't know what I feel bad about the position I'm in. I don't know how to help. I don't know how to do the best with this. I think I need to have some type of an experience to get me aligned with what I'm supposed to do. And so I've been, you know, a, a psychedelic concierge guide to these people. 
And on a public facing front, you know, the more we have Lamar Odom and Michelle Rodriguez and, you know, Tim Ferriss and uh, Michael Pollan and, mm. you know, all these, you know, Joe Rogans and all these intelligent, you know, thriving people mm-hmm. talking about, you know, how they're using these catalysts. It's getting easier and easier. You know, mm-hmm. years ago when I would say this, you know, people would be like, oh, God, you know, don't talk to that guy or don't invite him to that right. the, the party because this is going to go bad, you know. But mm-hmm. now it's like I don't care where I am. I could be in a, you know, in, in a startup company. I could be in a, you know, a Wall Street private equity, you know, multi hundred billion dollar firm, top philanthropist, uh, celebrity, and all of them immediately say they tune into what I'm saying and, and, and all of them want to have some level of experience and direct experience with these catalysts now. It's, mm. it's out. Mm-hmm. So, so from your point of view, very little pushback. Most of them are welcoming, if not uh, curious, uh, at least about your personal experience, the research you've seen and the other uh, people's testimonials as well. Is that an accurate way to reflect it's back what you said? Very accurate. And I think the difference right now between us using these catalysts in a positive way and maybe what happened 50 years ago when these things became illegal mm. is that back then there used to be only three television networks, you know, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Mm-hmm. There were only a couple of big newspapers or magazines that carried any credibility. So if they wanted to make this go away or sound like, you know, hippie, trippy things, they could do it. But mm. now with the internet, advertising information, you know, take cannabis, for example, there's enough people now who've done cannabis who never would have, but now if the, you know, the establishment or some study comes out and they say, oh, cannabis might not be good. Well, you know, these people are like, well, it's working for me and I feel better and my health seems to be better. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And there's enough information behind that to support their, you know, belief. And so, you know, I, I really believe nature is very, very intelligent and it, recognizes that people are, you know, very stressed and they're experiencing new types of disease that we've never had before. So it's bringing out these natural elements, you know, cannabis, ayahuasca, iboga, and it's recognizing that through almost like through the marijuana and the cannabis, by that being, you know, ubiquitous within society and people having their own direct experience that for the first time they're saying, oh, well, this is, seems to be good for me. So all the stuff that I was told about it being bad, I realized that that wasn't true or it was mm. incorrect. And so what else are they incorrect about? Could mm. these catalysts like, you know, psilocybin or ayahuasca or ketamine, could this be something that could positively affect my life without mm. it having to be, you know, a taboo thing that they, you know, do in the privacy of, you know, some some setting. It's mm. very public. And I think, um, I want to tell you one quick story. There's Please. a CBD company called hemp lucid mm. in Salt Lake city, Utah. And I friendly with them. They're part of the treatment that we gave to Lamar, um, was integrating CBD into his life as well. And as I got to know that I started to bring a few of the executives to the ketamine places that we have relationship with. And they started to get a lot of, got rid of a lot of their PTSD and trauma that they had and started to feel more, you know, uh, more resolute in their conviction and their, you know, vision for what, what was happening on business life. And then uh, Chase Hudson, who is the CEO, became so compelled by what was happening with the people who had done ketamine that he decided to offer the ketamine treatments to everybody in his in his company uh, and top management. So he gave to 20 people, went to do ketamine, multiple treatments. And now as a unit, they're thriving. Mm. You know, they're, they're, they're work, they're working as well as they ever work better, you know, and they're just, they're thriving at a much higher level. The business has totally exploded mm. and they're thriving because they're all resonating at this rate. See, and they understand what the other people have. They have empathy for their 
other people so there's not no backstabbing anymore mm. there's no competition it's all you know a very you know focused energy on getting their product and their you know their number one initiative out and so you i think that's like the future of work and the future of being an entrepreneur and having employees or in corporate culture having employees it's it used to be just you know yeah, you pay them or you give yeah. them health insurance. Right. But now it's like you have, there's so the unemployment so low that you have to attract these people and keep them in a way that's going to be satisfying, satisfying for them. Right. And that includes now meditation, breathing, right. these different catalysts. Could you bring them an experience that's going to, you know, really solidify them with the group and strengthen them as an individual so you get the most you can out of them. Mm. And I think this is the future of work is paying attention beyond the work environment, but having to bring something to the table for everybody on a mental and spiritual well-being level. You are talking to a former head of culture for a startup that grew from 20 people to 200 people from uh, an idea to a valuation of a billion dollar plus. So um, you're definitely preaching to the choir. I can't wait to uh, really see companies offering a benefit like what you just described. Because in my mind, we make what we are. So if we individually, as well as collectively as a team, are more aligned, the product services that we offer to our clients are definitely a lot more aligned and yes. more on point. So um, awesome. A uh, couple yeah. more questions. One is uh, for those people who are psychedelic, in, in, in their psychedelic closet, what would you say to them? You know, from someone who is now being super public, super uh, an, an advocacy about their, you know, psychedelic use. You, you even started a psychedelic concierge company or organization, rather. What would you say to those who are passive, passive participants in their closet? Yeah, I would say, really, this is the time to embrace it because if you embrace it, publicly and this becomes recognized for what it is which is a incredible tool in the tool set of mental health in uh, performance based lifestyle that if you're early to that you're going to have a, your own strategic advantage and you're also going to be recognized as a being on the forefront of this and I think if you wait till later to you know become part of this community of people that are talking and sharing this, you know, to be part of that. It's so fulfilling. It's so rewarding to be talking to people who are like-minded, you know, like you and I, we don't know each other, you know, like a friend from college or something, but we have this, you know, uh, part of ourselves through this plant medicine that we're so aligned on that mm -hmm. I, I could have a conversation with you for three days. I can, mm. you know, align with you immediately in business because I don't have to question where your intention is. I don't have to wonder if you're, you know, if I'm reading you properly. Mm. I just know that I am based on our shared base frequency experience that we're, we're having. Mm. And so it's a really, it's, you know, there's no reason not to embrace it now, especially, you know, kind of like if you embrace cannabis in 2012, you know, mm -hmm. obviously right now, nobody's going to say, you know, that that was a negative thing. And I think, you know, if even in, you know, the corporate cultures, uh, and I call this uh, internal engineering, what mm -hmm. it is that you're trying to do, you're trying to internally engineer yourself to and your company to be have a, you know, a really solid frequency and foundation. So if you can, you know, everything you're experiencing on the outside is being, is based on how you're, how things are resonating internally. So the best thing to do from a corporate culture standpoint, whether you're 20 people or 200 people, if you can set a corporate culture that includes, 
you know, um, tuning into that frequency, uh, group effect, be that medica- meditation or taking your group to, you know, do a legal cacao ceremony or taking a retreat and doing a plant medicine experience with your leadership team mm. or funding ketamine for everybody because everybody has some PTSD and then you benefit just like Oprah Winfrey, you know, she taught her, you know, 200 person, uh, staff to do meditation because Mm. she knew that that was going to create this collective consciousness that was going to be much stronger Mm. than uh, anything else. And I think here, what we're talking about is of course, in a vacuum years ago and decades and hundreds of years ago, just sitting down and meditating and being in nature probably would be effective. But Mm -hmm. we're living in this culture where all this bombardment of media and, you know, uh, just all this advertising and everything's coming at you. And if you, if your employees and your team is not strong and aligned, you're going to be disrupted at some point. And you're definitely not going to get the most out of your people. But if you could just align everybody's frequency, and that's what this internal engineering is all about, is just getting everybody on the same page of understanding what that number one most important reason for being for the company is and align with that and also be resolute in their own frequency. There's, I mean, that's how you, you know, create a, you know, a behemoth from a little company and you know that you can take on anybody but if you're running around trying to you know deal with things in a regular approach um you know it's going to be very difficult to keep employees and you're certainly not going to be thriving on the cutting edge that takes a different level of thinking and thank goodness now we know that there are these catalysts that can very gently uh take people to that path and that thought process and that creativity and Mm. uh you can unleash it for any company regardless of size and it doesn't have to be an expensive thing these are you know a lot of things that you can do very cost effectively but the the results are so huge Mm. that it's incredible and quick for sure. I mean, one of the things if you really think about just even hiring one engineer, minimally you're costing six figures, right? Maximally it's yep. seven figures, right? So what is the, you know, ROI if you're able to unleash the percentage of their creativity, you know, not to mention, so that's just one person, not to mention yep. your entire payroll. I mean, so for anyone that's really listening to this, You know, obviously I'm a little biased, but I'm a huge advocate for everything you just proposed. Yeah. And and even like, you know, when you have, you know, when you're projecting what your company's worth, if you have, you know, a hundred engineers, you could probably justify why that's a hundred million dollar plus enterprise just based on that. And so how do you keep those engineers there? How do you keep them from, you know, leaving how do you keep them from being distracted because something happened at their home or in the business or in their life or health wise and how do you keep them eye on the prize Mm -hmm. and now we know we have these tools Mm -hmm. where we can you know focus everybody's attention and ultimately you know i'm really looking forward to the day that psilocybin microdosing with psilocybin mushrooms is a regular everyday kind of thing like fluoride in the water Mm -hmm. because i think when people are vibrating at a high frequency have a lot of energy and these psilocybin mushrooms are doing all this incredible healing that you know that's just a better way to be walking around in society and if everybody's walking around at a high frequency with a lot of empathy you know things that used to seem like a problem are actually you know opportunity and you can mm-hmm. see that as an opportunity instead of a problem. Absolutely. Zappi, thank you so much for sharing. I, I acknowledge you for sharing your story, for for really witnessing your journey from selling beer to now helping people alleviate suffering. I mean, that's that's awesome. Just, you know, from a third party point of view, watching your own growth and and and, and you know, projection. So I really, appreciate it. 
yeah. I, again, I, I just believe in sharing these things. And, you know, now, you know, with cell phones and everything, it's so easy to share that when you do have the experience yourself and you share it, you know, it, it really is like it, it accelerates the benefits that you're getting. So I'm, I'm psyched to share it. I, I wouldn't know what to do other than to share it because I'm so excited about it. But mm. it's just great that we now all have the tools to share these things and we can do it cost effectively and we can help somebody else. Mm. Beautiful. Now, so for, thanks for doing what you do. Absolutely. For, for those people listening uh, who want to follow up with your story, your narratives, and as well as, you know, what you're up to, where should they go to follow what you're doing? Um, so I could definitely direct them maybe to zappy.com where you could find some of these elements. Mm. I would definitely tell you to watch the reality of truth on YouTube mm. or on Amazon Prime or Gaia Network. Mm. Uh, it's been we've now had over seven million people mm. watch the reality of truth, mm. and it's a really great way to get a lot of information and see a lot of people's direct experience mm. in one hour and mm. to make a determination and a decision from there about how it resonates with you. Mm. And then I would say definitely check out odomreborn.com. That's like the, the website for the Odom Reborn documentary. And then lastly, I'll say check out ketaminefund.org. Mm. You can see some of these videos of these veterans having these incredible immediate transformations and mm. uh, some of those those stories and learn about ketamine for yourself because everybody's got some trauma mm. and everybody has PTSD. Quite frankly, if you turn on the TV and watch the news right now, you're going to have PTSD. So you're going to have to break yourself out of that some way, somehow, and possibly ketamine, if you're living in this Western society, could be a great way for you to explore that so i would check out those resources so actually a quick question one thing i did forget to ask you um some people who let's just look at severity as a as a kind of like a benchmark somebody who is suicidal suicidal ideation they know they have depression anxiety ptsd so they're actively seeking help right and some of the people who are listening for this, they may not have that level of severity. What are some of the symptoms would they see? Let's say if we were watching the former you or um, whoever that you have helped over the, you know, on a movie screen, what are some of the symptoms they would see on the movie screen for them to say, oh, okay, so these are the yeah. type of like behaviors that I should watch out for. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say if you're feeling anxiety, if you're feeling not fulfilled, if you're feeling a lack of hope, a lack of joy. Well, what, 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 yeah, but, but those are emotional states, right? It's hard to point to and say, oh, okay, that's the kind of behaviors I should watch out for. So if we were to watch the people that you have helped on a movie screen, what would they, what would they see? They would see that these, everybody's a human being, you know, mm. they would see the human side of these people. And what they would see in that movie is you can look at the energy of Michelle Rodriguez at the beginning of the movie. Mm. Then you can look at her energy after she did the San Pedro. Mm. And then you can look at her energy after she did the ayahuasca. And then you can look at her energy after she came back and let's say her friend Paul Walker died mm -hmm. during that time. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at her, you know, thriving in the latest installation of, um, of the Fast and Furious. And you can see her evolution of her energy. So when mm -hmm. you're watching that, looking at this, just look at those people's energies. It will be very apparent to you mm -hmm. that their energy is mm -hmm. vibrating a much more true frequency to themselves mm. and and that you can see on screen it's bringing them joy it's bringing them fulfillment in their everyday life because we mm. all have to wake up fight the battle today and fight it again tomorrow and when you see somebody doing it with you know satisfaction joy um, um you know 
you, you want to emulate that. And you can't emulate their energy. You have to find your own frequency. And then when you get to that, you can't help but radiate positive energy. I appreciate this. Zappy, thank you so much for sharing your story once again. You too. Appreciate what you, you're doing and sharing this. So it's very, uh, it's always been cutting edge and this is, I, I'm happy to be part of it. So thank you. Awesome. Now, a little housekeeping. If you want to get one of the most powerful techniques I've learned to get clarity about your greater purpose in a direct and accelerated way, go to noblewarrior.com forward slash purpose. I also want to take a quick moment to talk to you. If you're enjoying this episode and all the nuggets of wisdom shared here by Zappi, please take a moment and go to bit.ly forward slash noble warrior review and leave us a five-star review. It will really help other entrepreneurs and leaders like you find us. Thanks in advance. I hope you guys love this conversation with Zappi as much as I did.